Hi everyone, this presentation is going to be around problems and an evaluation of the liability of the tort of negligence. What I'd like you to do to start off, thinking back over everything that you've learned about the tort of negligence, looking at duty of care, breach of duty, and breach of duty causing damage, I'd like you to think about any problems that you can identify with the law. I'd also like you to have a think about the fault-based element because what we are doing when we are proving somebody owes a duty of care, that they have breached that duty of care and that breach of duty has caused damage, we are proving that they are at fault. And you've got to prove that fault element, that they breached the duty and that caused the damage every time. And I want you to think about is that fault element always appropriate? So when we're looking at negligence, the fault element is indicative of blameworthiness and we need to find somebody at fault in order to successfully sue in negligence. If you can't find anybody who is to blame, you may have suffered damage, but you won't be able to claim for that. So the first element that I want us to have a look at is this fault-based system. So I said before, you have to prove that somebody is at fault. And this can result in a few problems. So what I would like you to do, as we're going through this presentation, I'd like you to make some notes. I'm going to put some key points on the slides and I'd like you to make a note of those. So you're going to paraphrase what's on the slides and then write down some of the material that I add in underneath that. And that will give you the basis of an answer evaluating liability and negligence. So the first issue is the cost when it comes to proving fault. You may need to produce medical evidence, you may need to produce expert evidence, and this can be very, very expensive. And this can actually exclude some people from the process. It may be that it's impossible to produce any evidence, and that will mean that the claim fails. So it may be that you have a very strong case, but you can't prove it, and therefore your, your claim will fail. Another issue is the delay. This is especially a problem if you're going through an insurance company, so if you're claiming against somebody because of a, a road traffic accident, or if the matter has to go to court. This can cause a great deal of delay, which may make the damage worse, and it also adds additional stress and distress to the parties involved. There's also an issue around the need to use lawyers. Sometimes to ensure that a case is presented most effectively in court, a lawyer is a necessary evil. And this adds to the cost and the delay element as well. This may ensure a quality of arms, especially if you've got an individual who is going up against a big company or an insurance company who does this all day, every day. If you're entering into a no-win, no-fee agreement, the lawyer has got to be approximately 70% sure that the claim will be successful. Now, this is a double-edged sword because if your claim is accepted, you know that there is a good chance that you're going to be successful, that you will be able to prove that fault and that you will be able to claim successfully. However, there may be fantastic claims with a lot of legitimacy, but there isn't sufficient evidence or the lawyer doesn't think it has a 70% chance of success and therefore it won't be accepted. And finally, on the fault-based system, you have the confrontation to do between the two parties. What you are essentially doing in the tort of negligence is proving somebody has done something wrong. And we all know human nature, we don't like to admit that we are wrong. We have what is known as an adversarial system. So you have one party up against and trying to prove the other party wrong. This can create greater delays and greater costs, especially when things are going to court. Another major issue is judicial lawmaking. When you're studying judicial precedent and the way that this works, you'll spend quite a lot of time looking at this, um, looking at whether judges 
are creative, whether they should be creative. I'm not really going to go into much detail there because that's an entire different thing. But a lot of the law of tort and negligence in particular has developed through precedent. So not through the will of Parliament. We know that Donoghue and Stevenson was the first case that really set everything off. And there were previous cases that led to that, but that was the key case that really started everything off and created this area of law that we now know as negligence. This was a very important decision, but you can't avoid the fact that judges are unelected. Their job is to apply and to declare the law, not to create law, which is effectively what they did. So it can be seen that the decision in Donoghue and Stevenson is highly undemocratic because unelected people made a law which now binds everybody. And it can be said that judges don't have the knowledge or experience to make social or economic judgments. There are cases that indicate that judges are getting involved in areas that maybe they shouldn't. Although when you are looking at judicial precedent and judges possibly making law, you will see that judges use these powers sparingly and only when they feel they absolutely have to. So they're not creating new laws left, right and centre, which Parliament and then having to go back and unpick, they are doing it absolutely sparingly and when they feel they have no other choice. But it is true to say that judges have a great deal of experience and knowledge in legal matters. So when it comes to extending a legal principle to the next logical point, it may be that judges have better idea about how that needs to be done rather than Parliament. And also, a judge can only make a decision, make a new law, in inverted commas, on the case which is presented in front of them on that day. So the changes that judges make generally are very small and on a case-by-case -case basis. Whereas Parliament will be making entirely new areas of law and changing vast areas whereas judges will be making small, incremental changes on a case-by-case -case basis. Another issue that we need to have a look at is policy issues. Sometimes judges have to make law for a policy reason. This is quite often a reason of to do with fairness, where if they acted differently, it would produce a very unfair or unjust reason. And this can be seen in the case of White and Jones. In this case, a claimant had expected to claim money from a will, but they were unable to because the will was negligently drafted and was therefore ineffective. The court held that the claimant was owed a duty of care and therefore could claim the against the solicitor who drafted it. But this went against the normal rules because the claimant didn't have a contract with the solicitor and was arguably too remote to sue in negligence. And Lord Gough said this, he stated that the court's job was to fashion a remedy to fill a lacuna, which is a gap in the law, and so prevent the injustice which would have otherwise occurred on the facts of cases such as the present. So what the judge is giving us is two things. Number one, a really cool word to use instead of gap, lacuna, a gap. Um, and also says that the courts and judges will decide a case differently in order to prevent an injustice. So sometimes when we're looking at the law of negligence, there will be these policy issues which will mean that a decision is decided differently to the way that really the law should be if it's interpreted literally. So we've looked at a range of problems now we need to have a think about some ideas for reform and there are a variety of different ideas, uh, some of which you can see in action in other countries. So you could have a state run system. In Canada there is an accidents at work scheme and the beauty of this is that there are no insurance companies to delay claims, there are no lawyers costs involved and payouts are made to those who are injured not just the ones who can prove fault. So the idea is 
if in Canada you are injured whilst at work, you will receive compensation for that. And it will be done very quickly because all you have to do is prove that you were injured. You don't have to prove that it was anybody's fault. The drawback is going to be that the employers have to pay into this scheme in order to make it work. And whether or not they are actually responsible for this injury, they still have to pay in. So there are some arguments, and it's the same argument with all of these no-fault arrangements, that people will be less careful because there's no, air quotes again, punishment if you are at fault. Whether you're at fault and blameworthy or not, with these no-fault systems, you still have to pay out. In New Zealand, they go even further than the Canadian system, and they have a no-fault system which covers a wide range of injuries. And this was suggested by the Pearson Committee in the UK in 1975 that we should adopt a system like this. However, it wasn't adopted by the Conservative government at the time, and it hasn't been considered again. Another system which has been suggested is compulsory insurance, like the American system. In America, you have to pay for your health insurance, and if you are injured and you need to use that insurance, you will get a payout, whether or not the injury was your fault or somebody else's fault. However, this system is very expensive, it's not available for everybody, and with the current political system at the moment, there is some suggestion about changing, reforming that particular system. So we don't know quite what's going to happen in the future. Another idea for reform is that there should be a greater use of out-of-court settlements. So instead of going to court, which is very time consuming, very costly, there's the suggestion that it should be settled before going to court through negotiation. And the final suggestion is to raise the lower limit for personal injury claims to £5,000. The suggestion is that this would ensure that only people with a genuine claim would be able to go ahead and claim, and it would reduce the number of whiplash claims, which are something which is causing a great deal of backlog in the system. So from the notes that you've made over the last few slides, you should now be able to answer the question above, advise whether the law of negligence is appropriate for nine marks. You need to have a think about some of the issues, I wouldn't describe them as problems, but issues that you could consider, which we've had a look at over the previous slides, the fault-based system, delay, need for lawyers, judicial lawmaking, and policy issues, and also be able to suggest some ideas for reform. If you've got any questions or that's not clear, please make sure that you go back and have a look at the video again. And if you've got any questions, problems, queries, if you want to leave a comment in the box below, then I can get back to you.